Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special episode of The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's bi-weekly webcast on fiscal policy for the COVID-19 economy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host, Howard Gleckman, a senior fellow at TPC and editor of our blog, TaxVox. Our special guest today is Ohio Republican Senator Rob Portman. Senator Portman is a member of the Senate Finance Committee, as well as committees on Homeland Security and Foreign Relations. Before we begin our usual bit of housekeeping, we encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please identify yourself and your organization uh, as if you were asking your question in person. The event's being recorded and will be posted online at TPC's website in the near future. If you'd like to join the conversation on social media, please use the hashtag live at urban. And if you'd like to suggest a future guest for the prescription, just email us at info at taxpolicycenter.org. So Senator Portman is a few minutes late. Um, uh, until he gets here, I'm gonna uh, be chatting with Mark Mazur, the director of the Tax Policy Center. Um, and Mark, uh, let's get started by talking just for a second about um, uh, the differences between what uh, Vice President Biden has proposed and um, uh, President Trump has proposed in terms of tax policy. Well, as you know, the Tax Policy Center's put out uh, analyses of both the Biden plan and uh, the, the President Trump's plan in the last couple of weeks. Um, they're quite different. In the Biden plan, there's over 50 very specific proposals. I mean, obviously, there's campaign proposals, so they're, they're not like legislative proposals with all the specificity, but they are specific enough that you can understand what the implications are. The uh, plan that's on the President's campaign website is largely a set of bullet points. It's just uh, one line descriptions of a number of things. Um, in addition, the president proposed to um, extend the individual and estate tax cuts in the T Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in, in his budget. And he's talked about um, supporting the judicial effort to overturn the Affordable Care Act. And so you can kind of mix and match those, those uh, components to try and put together a uh, analysis that indicates what uh, the implications of both of those plans are. So one of the interesting things that we found was that while there are vast differences in the proposals, uh, there also are some interesting similarities, uh, including that both would provide a modest middle income tax cut, although in very different time frames. Correct. Uh, the president's plan to extend the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act would generally lower taxes for about two thirds of individual income taxpayers uh, throughout the income distribution. And it would be a several hundred dollar tax cut for middle income families, but it would not occur until 2026 because the provisions in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act expire at the end of 2025. In contrast, uh, Senator, uh, former Vice President Biden has uh, a, a number of proposals to cut uh, taxes across the, the income distribution, but the largest is the um, one for the expanding the child tax credit, which benefits okay. lower and middle income families. Okay, Mark, and I see Senator Portman is here. Uh, Senator, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, well, it's great to, great to have you. I'm technologically challenged here. I'm doing this myself this morning. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had a little glitch, so I apologize. I'm a little late. I saw Mark was on earlier. Yes. You're your own tech support. Hey, Mark. Well, well, welcome to the welcome to the brave new world where we we, we all have become uh, uh, tech experts, uh, more or less. <laughs> I, I sympathize with you. So, Senator Portman, welcome to the prescription. It's great to have you. Uh, I hope you can help us learn a little more about uh, President Trump's tax agenda, uh, what he might pursue in his second term. Uh, for instance, at a campaign event uh, on Wednesday, uh, the president promised what he called a massive middle class tax cut in his second term. Can you help us understand a little bit what that might look like? Well, I think the first uh, order of business is to be sure that what worked uh, in the 2017 bill continues. Can you hear me okay, Howard? Yeah, yeah you're doing fine. Um, and so, you know, I, I look at the expiring provisions, uh, including a number of provisions that help on the uh, economic growth side uh, and the new markets tax credit uh, and issues like the excise tax on the uh, brewers and so on, all that expires, but also in the last year of his presidency, should he be reelected, of course, you have all the individual tax provisions expiring. So as an example, um, 
the doubling of the standard deduction and, and the rates would, would all change. So I think that's so important. I think the R&D amortization that would happen at the end of 2021 uh, is, is critical. And I assume that whether it's a Republican or a Democrat uh, who's reelected, we take a look at that because uh, I think it's clear that the ability to expense uh, under the R&D is important for industry uh, and uh, our economic growth right, right now. So that's important. The 199 pass through, which is for small businesses, I think is really important. So I think that will be the top priority is, you know, looking at what's expiring and being sure that uh, those provisions uh, can continue. And, you know, let's, uh, Think of the alternative, which is that if we are, are not able to extend those, uh, then we're not going to see this some kind of economic, not just macro growth, but the opportunity economy that we had prior to uh, COVID-19. So let me let, let, let's let's talk for a minute about the individual side. So uh, as, as you probably know, TPC has done an analysis of the Biden plan and, and done uh, what we could as an analysis of the Trump plan. And uh, what we found was was kind of interesting. We, we concluded that uh, by extending the, the, the TCJA, President Trump would uh, cut taxes on average by, for a middle income household by about $860, uh, but not until 2026, because of course the provisions of the TCJA don't expire until 2025. On the other hand, Biden would cut taxes for middle income house, households by a small amount, about $600, uh, but he would do it immediately, but only temporarily. So I think a, a, an interesting question is, do you think given the economy, given the rest, it, it's best to cut taxes in 2021 for those middle income families, or would it be best to wait until 2026? Well, I'm, I'm a little confused by your analysis on, on the Trump plan. Are you suggesting that uh, he would not want to change uh, TCJA and therefore there'd be no additional relief until 2026? Well, you know, what I'm saying is that, that based on what he said so far, that he's talked about extending the individual provisions of uh, the right. TCJA, but since they don't expire until 2025, the, the uh, taxpayers wouldn't get a benefit from it until 2026. Oh, I see. So, yeah. Yeah. So it wouldn't be an immediate tax cut. It wouldn't happen until after the existing tax reductions right. expire. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think two things. One, uh, Having uh, looked at the website this morning, it's more general in terms of tax cuts. I don't know that he means that uh, there wouldn't be additional tax relief for middle class families over the next few years. Uh, in other words, I, I, I don't know that, that that differs so much from what the Biden plan might be for uh, middle income families. But I also don't know, uh, you know, what, again, this, the doubling the standard deduction as an example uh, is something, as they said, in the Biden plan. I, I, I don't know exactly what. Uh, uh, Vice President Biden is proposing either because it's been it's been pretty general. Well, actually, in fairness, and I'm not going to defend Biden, but in fairness, he's proposed I think 50 different, relatively specific proposals for campaign proposals. And I think one of the things that disappointed disappointed me for sure is is that President Trump has not said very much about what he would do in terms of a tax agenda in the second term. In fact, I was thinking. You know, I've been watching presidential campaigns since 1972, and I've never seen uh, a campaign that said less about what they do in a, in, in, if they were elected than President Trump has. And I wonder if, if, that's, if you think that's a mistake. Do you think that candidates should be more uh, 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 transparent about what they would do in a, in, if they're elected to a public office? Well, I think he's being very transparent in the sense that uh, in 2017, it was the first time in 50 years that we had had a substantial reform of the tax code. And it provided, uh, as you know, uh, because you analyzed it, uh, extensive tax relief for middle class families, as well as tax relief for small businesses under the 199 pass through, as well as reducing the corporate rate to 21, which has resulted in a lot of jobs and investment. And Howard, if you look at what has resulted from that, uh, and the Tax Foundation recently did something on this. And I know some people would want to include regulatory relief or maybe how we've approached energy uh, in, the, in the last few years. But the fact is that pre-COVID-19, uh, a huge difference in people's lives that you had 90% of taxpayers seeing a withholding change um, to the positive <laughs> from their perspective. So, uh, and obviously you had, as of February, 19 straight months of wage growth of over 3%, which is extraordinary. And so when I hear candidates, including uh, Vice President, uh, former Vice President Biden say that, you know, he would like to help close the wage gap, I'm thinking, well, 
gosh, that, that was actually happening. And if you look at the new data from the Census Bureau and the new data from the Federal Reserve, it does show that in fact, there, there was a, a lessening of that gap in, in the lowest poverty rate as an example, since we began tracking it back in the 50s, the lowest poverty rate our nation's had, and obviously 50 year low in unemployment overall and historically low for blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and so on. So it was working. And I think so part of what President Trump is saying on the campaign trail is, I'm not gonna raise your taxes, whereas, uh, uh, because it was working. And it was not just working again to help the broader economy, but specifically to create more opportunity to bring people off the sidelines. And, and that's what I really like, Howard, about what was happening. I think as Republicans, frankly, we don't talk about that enough. And I think, you know, if, if Democrats had that record of, again, not just the, the growth, the 3% growth and annualized, but the notion that, you know, we were actually helping to increase wages. That wage growth, by the way, I talked about, when you look at it, the, the, the biggest percentage increase in wages was coming from lower and middle income workers. And the same is true, you know, with, with regard to the poverty rate being lower, that's going to help people um, who have been on the sidelines, who, who were able to come back into work. And obviously the job market was, was, was very hot. So you had a lot of um, a lot of people who had not been working coming back in and even finally seeing the labor force participation rate begin to increase. So I think that's more his position is, uh, you know, continued middle class tax relief and continued tax relief across the board to create more jobs and economic opportunity. So more money in your pocket. And he's talked about some numbers there, but also more, more jobs and higher wages and benefits. I want to be clear. So you, do you think it's possible that he may propose some sort of a tax cut uh, for middle-class families uh, that would take effect sooner than just extending the TCJA? I, I, again, you, you uh, repeated his comments at the event the other night. I think that's true. I think he's talking about doing something more. Um, I don't think there is a specific proposal yet. You're correct. Um, and yet, um, again, the, the, the biggest priority has to be to keep what we have in place because it was working very well, as I said. And again, all the data supports that, including more recent data that uh, we haven't talked about much, again, from the Census Bureau and the Federal Reserve as to the impact on poverty and the impact on, on people coming back into work who had been on the sidelines. So let me push back a little bit on that. So one, one of the um, primary arguments of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act business provisions was that by cutting corporate taxes, it would encourage business investment. And the business investment would eventually generate this long-term uh, increase in wages. But looking at the data for 2018, 2019, and 2020 before COVID, uh, there was very little increase in business investment. There was a little bit of a bump uh, early 2018, and then it, it basically went away. So I, I, I wonder, uh, as a member of the Finance Committee, as you look back on that, are there things you think we could do differently now in terms of uh, adjusting the way we're treating uh, corporate taxes to maybe get that business investment up? Or, or, or was that, that flat business investment uh, environment a uh, result of things other than taxes? Well, first, I'm not sure I agree with the with the premise because uh, Howard, there's a $482 billion increase in investment during that time period from when the tax legislation went into effect in 2018 and until the COVID period. That 482 billion, I think, is widely accepted, and that's that's new investment in businesses. So, um, would it have been better had it been more? Yes, <laughs> but the alternative is also true. If we had not done it. As you know, we would have had continued movement of jobs and investment overseas. And that was happening uh, to the point that when there was a transaction, when there was a sale of a company, the vast majority were going to foreign owners of publicly traded companies. And uh, you know, one of the favorite examples as a beer drinker I like to use is that Sam Adams was the last you know, beer company left in America that was brewing beer of any size. And having talked to their CEO and, and founder about that. It was only because he was willing to continue to take a hit on the on the tax consequences because it made no sense to be an American company because you had a lower rate for the Steve's and you could then sell you know your product back to the United States. And we've flipped that where between the lower rate, the 21% rate, and the ability to write off your investment, it made more sense to stay in the United States. And you've seen as a result uh, some companies you know repatriating, other companies 
um, investing here uh, that are American companies and being able to survive. So, you know, I live in Ohio, so I use Procter & Gamble as an, as an example. You know, they are much more competitive vis-a-vis uh, -vis their European competitors uh, than they were prior to the tax code and therefore able to make additional investments here. And frankly, you know, they weren't making additional investments here because you know that is a very competitive market. At least they weren't making more investments overseas as they were making new investments. In other words, they, they, you have to think about the alternative to what would have happened had we not put that in place. And by the way, our corporate rate is still relatively high compared to the OECD average. Two thirds of OECD countries, which is the other industrialized countries, have rates that are lower than ours if you take into account our state corporate and our federal, which averages out to about 25%. So I'm glad we did it because I think it saved a lot of jobs and it stopped what was unfortunately um, a, a lot of investment going over overseas, uh, but we're still you know, above the average of our industrialized uh, country counterparts. So it's not as though we are uh, the most competitive country in the world in terms of our tax code. The president has proposed um, what he calls a made in America tax credit. And I, I, I think about um, uh, American manufacturers, so many of their parts, so much of their intellectual property crosses borders, their supply chains cross borders. Have you thought a little bit about how a made in America tax credit could actually work? Yeah, I've, I've, so I've seen discussion of that and I haven't seen, there haven't been specifics on it. Um, I think uh, Vice President Biden's also talked about the same general idea. Uh, I don't know if he's called it made in America, but he's talked about the fact that he's going to uh, tax companies that don't produce stuff here more than if you do produce them here. Um, yeah, I mean, it is tricky because we have such a interdependent global economy now with uh, supply chains, but I do think post COVID there'll be more of an interest in not just reshoring um, uh, essential or you know sensitive uh, products like PPE, uh, which obviously is, is something that both Democrats and Republicans are interested in. How do you bring mass production, gown production, you know, glove production back here so we, so we can have a dependable source? But just in general, that we want to be sure that we're incentivizing people to, to invest here. So I think the best way to do it, frankly, is, is what we've done, doing more of it. In other words, being competitive globally. If we have a corporate rate that's higher than others and we have a system that is a territorial uh, type system, um, you know, we, we're, we're going to be at a, at a disadvantage. So we've, we've got to be sure that we are providing the incentive, including the ability to invest. And that's why uh, the expensing provisions were so important in TCGA, in my view. And in some respects, I think that was underappreciated. But that's where I would focus more. The uh, Made in America, um, also relates, Howard, to you know government purchases, which is something we do need to tighten up, that there's a way for us, and I've worked with Senator Brown on this, as you may know, to be able to come up with new ways for us to look at the government purchases, because that's a, obviously a huge market and an opportunity for us to allow some American companies to be competitive here. Uh, so I do think there's a Buy America, Made in America uh, push that uh, I think either administration would probably make. Do you think that there, there may be some some room for bipartisan legislation in that area? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we have some bipartisan legislation there. And by the way, in a lot of this stuff, like the New Markets Tax Credit, uh, as an example, um, or the Opportunity Zones, as an example, which expire in seven years, uh, I think there is opportunity for bipartisanship, and there and there perhaps uh, will be. Um, I mentioned the excise tax issue. I've talked about a lot here, but that's also wine and. and Distilled spirits and so on, that's always been bipartisan. And Senator Wyden and I just sent a letter with regard to that uh, so that the administration would know that there's bipartisan support for extending those tax provisions on the excise tax. It's, it's interesting, you know, the, the, the Finance Committee, as you well know, has had a, a long time reputation for bipartisanship. Yet the TCJA was, was enacted on a strictly partisan basis. And, and, I, and I wonder, um, in, in retrospect, did, did, did that set a bad precedent and, and is it going to get in the way if, let's say, President, uh, the, the Vice President Biden is elected and the, the Democrats get control of the Senate? Would, would, do you think they'll reach out to you or are they going to do the same thing and say, we'll pass our own bill? Well, first of all, it's hard to pass your own bill, as we found. Um, you have to do it under reconciliation, which means the budget has to be agreed on uh, House and Senate. Um, and we've 
we're able to do that by one or two votes. Uh, so it's it's not as easy as it might seem. Uh, I guess if the Democrats choose to get a, do away with the filibuster, which is something they're talking about, and I think the leadership would like to do that. I don't know whether rank and file are, are all on board yet, but again, that would require 51 votes or 50 plus a vice presidential vote, I guess, to break the tie. Um, so it kind of it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. One, number two, I agree with you. I think it's much better to have uh, some bipartisan buy-in, not just on tax policy, but any major policy. Why? Because it makes it uh, more sustainable over time. There's more certainty and predictability around that, which actually increases the impact of the tax provisions. Um, I think PCJA did provide uh, enough certainty because there's enough sense that at least with regard to the items that don't expire, like the 21% rate, you know, it, it would probably be likely to stay in place at least for a while. Nothing is permanent, of course, in Congress. Right. As you know, uh, when we talk about permanence, uh, I always chuckle because a lot of those permanent provisions have changed many times in the last few decades. But uh, yeah, it's, my, it's, it's, it's better to have some, some buy-in. It's also the right thing to do. You know, one thing that, uh, in speaking about bipartisanship that has been traditionally bipartisan in the Finance Committee, is retirement policy. And Senator Cardin and I have done three bills together already you know, over the last uh, really decade and a half or two decades. We've got another one, which is broad, that has to do with uh, the defined contribution side. So uh, a new catch up for over 60, expanding the savers credit, actually making parts of that refundable, um, changing the way uh, small businesses uh, are able to take a tax credit for having a, a defined contribution plan like a 401k. Uh, so we have a, a number of provisions in there that I think is very possible, regardless of which administration is elected or reelected for us to move forward on. We're hoping to have a hearing, by the way, in the lame duck session on, on our new proposal and other ideas on the defined contribution side. Just uh, late last week, uh, you probably saw that uh, Chairman Richie Neal and ranking Republican uh, Kevin Brady announced a very similar bill with a lot of overlap. So there's an example of something that can be totally uh, bipartisan if we can continue to you know, work together as, as we have really for two decades on this project uh, to expand people's opportunity to save for their own retirement. Speaking of bipartisanship, uh, uh, Vice President Biden has proposed a substantial tax increase for high income households and corporations, of course, but he's also proposed tax cuts for families with children, renters and first time home buyers. Are there any elements of those tax cuts that you might support? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think, uh, again, President Trump has talked generally about more tax cuts for middle class families. Uh, Senator Biden has talked, it sounds like, more specifically about, uh, as an example, expanding the child credit. It sounds like, you know, we just did expand the child credit substantially, made part of it, made more of it refundable. Um, so, you know, the uh, the Trump administration, I think, would be very interested in that. Uh, Ivanka Trump, as you know, was a strong supporter of expanding the child tax credit. And I think in the context of COVID, that might be an area for some bipartisanship because of the cost of child care and the concern that people have about uh, you know, people being able to go back to work uh, in this kind of environment where there's not adequate child care uh, provided, sometimes can't be provided because of COVID. So that credit might, might, might be actually uh, an interesting way to help address that challenge we've got right now uh, in our economy and among our families. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's possible. Uh, I do think, going back to your 400,000 point, and this is uh, an, a, a long time, uh, I think, misunderstanding by uh, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, you're gonna hit small businesses. So you know, small businesses pay their taxes as individuals. And the vast majority of companies in America are pass-throughs, uh, including virtually every small business. So when you're talking to somebody, uh, say uh, a woman who has created uh, on her own a, a business that is now you know, generating some revenue, she has to show it under 1040 every year. Uh, she may not be putting uh, one penny into her pocket. In other words, she may be getting a distribution just to pay her taxes from that company, which is not unusual. Uh, I grew up in a family business just exactly like that. And so uh, people could look at the 1040 and say, she's rich. She makes over 400,000 bucks a year. But the way our system works, and you can argue whether it's correct or not, uh, with pass-throughs being the vast majority of American companies, um, she may or may not feel rich <laughs> because 
she's just trying to support that business and the employees that she's brought on. So that's my big concern about what President Biden or former Vice President Biden is talking about. President Trump, on the other hand, has said he gets that. You know, we don't want to hurt small businesses during a time when we're trying to restore the uh, the economy, get it back on track. Just got a few minutes left. I want to ask you a couple more questions, if I can. One of them is about stimulus. You have been quite outspoken about the fact that you think that, that, that the, the White House and Congress should have gotten together before the election to do something about a, 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 a COVID bill. Uh, what do you think the chances are of, of something happening in a lame duck, or is this something we're going to have to wait for until next year? Howard, I think they're quite good, actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, making the connection here, the segue here between taxes and this, there are some tax provisions we should include. Uh, three in particular, uh, to me, the most compelling one is to have a, what I call the healthy workplace tax credit, which we have proposed. And it simply says that if you do spend money on the plexiglass partition or the hand sanitizer stations or reconfiguring your manufacturing floor because of COVID, you ought to be able to get a tax credit for those expenses. And I think that fits exactly with where Republicans and Democrats ought to be, which is we should not shut down the economy. We should keep the economy moving. We should keep people at work, uh, but we should do it safely. And so I think this is one where it has a lot of uh, bipartisan appeal and should be in any package going forward. By the way, if you talk to your uh, uh, particularly smaller business owners around the country, they really like it because a lot of them are at the margins, particularly if you're in the hospitality business, entertainment business, travel business, they're barely making it. And these costs are a significant problem uh, to their bottom line. So it's, it's an example of what can happen. I also think we should expand the work opportunity tax credit as you know, this is one that's one of those extenders that, uh, you know, frustrating. I think it should be made permanent, so-called permanent. Uh, but the Work Opportunity Tax Credit does not have a category for COVID-19 unemployed. That's a good thing to add to it. That's a credit that goes to those companies that hire those individuals. And I think that would be very helpful. And then finally, the Employee Retention Tax Credit. This was sort of the alternative to PPP. But for a lot of businesses, it actually could work quite well. I think we should expand that, make it a little more generous and be sure people can rely on it and make, make sure it's certain. So those are three tax provisions that would be very helpful. And by the way, that would go to companies of all sizes, not just under 500, and it, it wouldn't be tied up in the same issues we've had with PPP trying to move that forward. So I think those are our ideas that I think are very realistic. I believe that in the lame duck, we're gonna take this up, um, not just those tax provisions, but the broader COVID-19 package, because I do believe that we are not out of the woods in terms of the healthcare crisis. Obviously, we're looking at a third phase in places like Ohio that is devastating. Uh, but second, even though the economic growth numbers were really impressive for Q3, the third quarter numbers, you know, 33% annualized growth, unbelievable. On the other hand, we're not back to where we were uh, during the good times, which would be February of this year. And uh, we still need a little help to get through this period before we get to a vaccine. So in my view, there's kind of a three month period here where assuming the vaccine will be ready by the end of the year and will be distributed more broadly in February, March, which seems to be the time frame that the FDA is, is looking at, uh, not knowing exactly how these phase three trials are gonna work. But that period of time is really essential for us, in my view, uh, to provide some additional stimulus to the economy. And let's get us through this tough patch. And I think as a result, we will actually see more revenue coming in uh, because we can keep the economy moving as we have. If you look at the numbers again from Q3, a lot of the reason we're doing well is because of the first four COVID packages and because we do have a very resilient economy, let's face it, you know, and it was very strong going into the crisis, thank goodness. Uh, we talked about those numbers earlier. So Howard, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think we can get something done regardless of what happens uh, with regard to the elections. One last quick question, we'll let you go. You've been a leader over the years in IRS reform. Do you think the agency has the resources it needs to provide both good taxpayer service and effective enforcement? I think the, uh, the new commissioner, not so new now, but the commissioner has done a good job uh, in beginning to implement some of the reforms. And as you know, Senator Cardin and I uh, had a bill on Irish reforms, most of which was included in the final package. There's more we'd like to do. But those reforms are, are you know, far reaching and pretty, pretty uh, 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 helpful for not just more effective administration, but also uh, better taxpayer rights, and particularly on the on the appeals process. And I think he's implementing them well. 
And I think as Republicans and Democrats, we ought to look at that and provide him the resources that he needs to be able to run the department more effectively, specifically with regard uh, to ensuring you have adequate enforcement uh, because uh, with the new tax code now in place for three years and with the reforms that were put in place uh, about a year and a half ago now, I think, and they're beginning to be implemented, um, you know, he's kind of got the agency back on its feet, the morale's a little better, and I think it's time to provide adequate resources. So uh, I would be supportive of that. But I would not have done it but for, you know, having these reforms in place and having a leader there who, who gets it and who is, I think, uh, helped the IRS turn the corner in terms of some of the challenges it had on the, on the morale side with regard to personnel feeling like, you know, they weren't being supported. Senator Rob Portman, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I know it's a busy time, just a few days before the election. So uh, thanks again and good luck. Great, thanks Howard, appreciate it, take care.